All right, guys, I'm here with Shazan Mumphrey, uh, quarterback now of the Warsaw Eagles. He's been around Europe four seasons, uh, played all over the world. Shazan, what's going on? What's up, man? How's it going, bro? Uh, I'm doing pretty good. So where are you at now in the world? Kind of tell us, tell us what you've been going on recently. Where are you at? Um, so I'm currently in Warsaw, Poland. I was uh, originally headed over to Geneva, Geneva, Switzerland. I was going to go play for Coach Legault over at the Seahawks. and um, just some, man, things change, bro. Things change. And then I was, I had about a month, two months to, until I was going to head over to Switzerland. And then after I spoke with Larry and he gave me the okay to, uh, to just pursue other opportunities if I had them and stuff like that, I spoke with Warsaw and um, I was like, all right, so sounds good. They sent the contract over. I was like, all right, I like the contract. Everything sounds good. Heard good things about the city, the organization. So I was like, all right, when are you guys going to bring over? And like, like uh, April, May, and mind you, this was the end of February. He was like, nah, man, we're going to bring you over next week. <laughs> so it was just like, it happened so fast. And I've been here for a week now, so, yeah. And when's your season supposed and to kick off? Just so we can get around. Our first, our first game is going to be April 17th against the Ticket Falcons at Ticket. So that's going to be, uh, that'll be fun. Pretty Right around the corner, actually. We've practiced and. We've got training and, and weight training and everything, like, throughout the week. So, I think we'll be ready. Perfect. Let's start at the beginning, then. So let's take you back back, back in the day when you're st first starting sports. Uh, yeah. kind of where were you from in the States? What sports did you uh -huh. start? Family influence? Take us through that. Yeah, of course, bro. So, I'm from Louisville, Kentucky. So, when you hear Kentucky, first thing everybody thinks, basketball. Basketball, basketball, of course. Louisville, Kentucky. He, all the all the other small schools, Moorhead, Murray State, the, the basketball, like, like I don't know, I wouldn't want to say Mecca because, like, there's great basketball everywhere, but that's what we do in Kentucky. We play basketball. And that was my first sport. First sport I ever played basketball. First sport I ever loved basketball. And then um, ball too, I loved it. And then my father was a football player. He played at the University of Louisville. And then had a couple of brief stints, like, post-college and stuff like that too. But, like, so I got into it. And um, I grew up a coach fan, as you can see right here on the hat, <laughs> favorite player of all time, Peyton Manning. And then so, dude, when I first started playing football, I just wanted to play running back. That's what all the kids played. All the fun, all the fun looked like it was at running back. And so I wore number 28, like uh, like my favorite player at the time, Marshall Falk. And they stuck me at quarterback because I was taller than everybody and I could throw it. So I'm sitting there playing quarterback, wearing number 28 in Pop Warner and stuff like that. So, but yeah, man, that's how I got into it from my dad and, I just fell in love with the sport, bro. Even though I was playing position I didn't want to play, learned to love it, learned to learn it, embrace it, dude, and it's, it's brought me this far, so I'm just thankful. When did you start uh, really becoming a quarterback? When were you like, all right, I'm, I'm not only a football player, but I am the quarterback, I'm the man? Yeah. So that, that resonated with me probably as a freshman in high school. That's, that's probably when it, when it happened, because we, we had a really talented senior quarterback, and uh, so – like, but he was the only one we had. So I ended up, I ended up playing um, as a freshman, as a playing varsity as a freshman, I was a backup. And then I was just like, I looked up to him and everything like that. He taught me a whole lot of stuff. And then I was just like thinking like, man, like this is really going to be me next year as a 10th grader, 15 years old. And um, that's when, that's when it resonated with me. I was like, wow, <laughs> like I'm really quarterback. And that's when I started to really like study the position, learn the position, how to, had a really, really solid coach my freshman year, a quarterback coach that was uh, pretty well known around around Kentucky and stuff like that. But, like, that's when they set in, and that's when I was like, all right, that's what I'm going to do. I still played, played basketball in high school, still ran track and field and stuff in high school. But it was like, didn't I wasn't really sure whether I was going to play football or basketball in college. But, like, when the colleges and stuff started coming in, they started coming in talking to me for football. So, Kind of just ran with it from there. My dad always encouraged me to, if I get a scholarship to to play a sport, no matter what the sport is, after after high school, I got to take it. And like so, I was just like recruited mostly as 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 like football player, quarterback, athlete, whatever they needed. So I just took that route. So how did those take me through those three years of your high school football career? Kind of those post freshman year, once she was kind of your go. Yeah. You know, Man, we had it. We had it rough, man. Because believe it or not, football in Kentucky is really good, especially in the city of Louisville, big city, million people, thirty-five 
high schools total that play against each other and whatnot. So, I mean, it was it was it was some tough years, man. But we grinded out. We had a we had a solid group, good coaches. Had a few other teammates that ended up going to play college ball. A couple a couple D one, D twos, and NAIs and things like that. And um, I mean, so we just progressed, 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 and we all got better individually. We um, we struggled as a team just because competition was was really really good, solid. I mean, but um, besides that, I mean, it was it was great. It was worth every every second of it. All the blood, sweat, and tears, man. All of it. So, uh, junior, senior year, to kind of take me through when you started getting recruited, where you were getting recruited, how you were looking into that college process, uh, positions, because like you're you're an yeah. athlete, you could play. We could say play DN, play linebacker, play safety, play corner, play quarterback, running back, like whatever. So how did that so all go? So this is when the story starts to take uh, all type of crazy turns and whatnot. So sophomore year is the first time I'd ever started like being reached out to by, by schools and everything. And, and um, obviously when you're trying to go to college and everything, grades are a factor, you know? So I, um, I was getting recruited pretty heavily by some, some, some pretty big schools, like just here and there, like I would hear from teams like Illinois, Cincinnati, Middle Tennessee State and things like that. So I thought I was going to go to Middle Tennessee is where I thought I was going to end up because they loved me. Like, Justin Watts was his name, coach. He used to come to school all the time. He used to go watch my film with, with my head coach. They'd sit in there and talk for a long time while I was in gym class because like football locker room was in the back of the gym. So, like, I'd just be in gym, like, nervous, like, what's going on here type stuff. And so as it, as it like, continued to go junior year, it picked up a little bit. And then, like, we started to see that I didn't have grades. Like, I, I mean, I did okay in school, wasn't a great student about – average but obviously to be a student athlete and at the next level you got to have above average grades and scores and everything like that so I took the JUCO route and I actually ended up red shirting in football as a freshman in uh in JUCO but I played basketball my um my freshman year in college in JUCO and we we're pretty good man we were like number three in the country and stuff like that so it was it was a good time so last everyone sees last chance you so they're kind of understanding more what JUCO is around the world yeah uh how how was that experience for you? How was it balancing both sports? How did you get back on football? Man, the thing about about JUCO is is just like so. I redshirted in football because I mean I just wasn't wasn't ready like like physically, mentally as a freshman fresh out of high school I wasn't ready to play college football. So that's why I took the redshirt. With basketball, if you if you're talented, if you if you know the game a bit, have a good coach, you can step right in and play. So I didn't. I got back into football the next season. And, um, man, the JUCO grind is something different, bro. I, I applaud anybody that can go into JUCO as a non-qualifier for, for eligibility for college, make it out, and, and get a scholarship and finish, man, because it's, it's a tough task to do. I um, ended up – so I was at a JUCO that wasn't, like, super-duper prestigious. And, like, just my – the year that I did play – quarterback the year that I played like we had some dudes like our coach he recruited crazy and for some reason we just had a loaded team and so we had a really good season we we went like nine and two or something like that we went to the school's first ever bowl game and stuff and obviously I quarterback the offense and had some success but the other thing about the juco grind is that most of the time unless you're at a prestigious juco like like the ones that you see on last chance you and stuff like that you got to basically do your own recruiting bro so I spent hours daily just reaching out to schools. And because because I had already burned my red shirt, it was a bit tougher, bro, to get back on the on the FBS radar. So I had a bunch of FCS offers, a bunch of small D1 offers like that, and um, took, took all of my visits and ended up uh, falling in love with Florida A&M. And that's where, I, that's where I headed. Perfect. So transitioning back into Florida A&M quarterback, yeah. they want you to play athlete, they want – a little bit of everything, trying to come in, win a job. What was that? Yeah. So, yeah, I, they had a quarterback who had already been starting since a freshman when I got there, and it was his senior year coming up. But he broke his foot the, the previous year against South Carolina State, against uh, Darius Leonard for the Colts and whatnot, and Javon Hargrave for the Eagles, those guys. So he broke his foot. And um, so it was basically an open competition in camp for the job, and it was uh, it was between – Myself, a guy named Brian Blackburn, who's who was from Toledo, 
um, a guy called Carson Royal, who's from Jacksonville, Florida. His running back in high school was Derrick Henry. So I was surrounded by dudes. And our, our, our original starter quarterback, Damian Fleming, was from Reball down in Jacksonville. And he was Vanderbilt commit and things like that. So, like, it was, it was dudes around. And um, I ended up we, – we, I got there in the spring, and I ended up second on the depth chart in the spring. And then we got to fall camp and everything, and it was just me and Carson battling it out for uh, the number one job. And he kind of he kind of edged me out down at, at Florida A and M. And then miraculously, Damien was able to make it back from his foot injury, so I just got kind of pushed down the depth chart. And I'm just like me and Carson are, are pretty much the same grade. And even if like I was to step in right after Damien left, I'd only have one year to play. So I was just um, I, I was just like I like it. The D1 life is cool and everything, but, like, like you know, as a football player, competitor, especially quarterback, man, you want to play. So I just uh, – I had a scholarship offer from a school called Elon down in North Carolina, and um, Coach Pinsons was the head coach over there, and he had actually ended up taking a – he was the, he was the uh, offensive coordinator there, sorry. He ended up taking a head coaching job at a D2 school, and, you know, when you transfer, you have to sit out if you stay at the same level, or if you go up, you have to sit out here. I didn't have a year to sit out. So Coach P was at, at D2. It was the only D2 school I even knew. So I reached out to him, and he was like, man, we need a quarterback bad. Like, come on. And I was like, um, all right, sounds good. So after my little time at, at Florida A&M, about a year and a half, too, I just uh, shot on up to the University of New Haven in uh, West Haven, Connecticut. Okay, West Haven, Connecticut. How was the transition? Because you've kind of been down to Florida, now all the way up to Connecticut from Louisville. What was that? Yeah. One thing moving to Europe, no, was, that's big transitions just there. No, nah, man, it's crazy, though. It was uh, when I got to to New Haven, I just left. It was – I was December, and we were out, like, like throwing, training on the field, like no shirt, 60-degree weather in Florida. And then I get to – I get to – first of all, 2015, everybody up there says was – the worst winter they ever had. So that was my first experience from being since I had gotten to Florida uh, with with snow, and it was just ridiculous blizzards. It was it was unbelievable. It was a culture shock for me too, because people are a whole lot different in the Northeast than they are in the South. So it was. Uh, <laughs> I'll never forget the first day I met Coach Pete. I was talking to him. I met him up at the at the athletic facility, and I was like, um, we were just talking. And I'm like, yes, sir. Like, thank you, sir, and all of this, all of this. He was like. He's, he's from Boston. No, he's actually from – he's from Rhode Island, which is still New England, I suppose. But he went to Boston University, so he's got, like, the accent. He's got the – he's kind of, like, cold and whatnot. I was, like, just after after every sentence, like, I finished my sentences and stuff. with like, yes, sir, no, ma'am, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, things like that. He was, like – he was, like, hey, Shazam, I appreciate the Southern hospitality, but you don't got to fucking call me sir. I was, like <laughs> – I was, like, oh, my bad. And then – the, even my professors at UNH, man, they they were like the same. They were they would drop f bombs in class and like cursing. It was just completely new to me. But man, I got used to it, and I had, I had the time of my life at the University of New Haven. So how many how many years did you end up staying? Then left two or three. I did I did two years two years at, at UNH. So the the redshirt year in JUCO, the the next year in JUCO when I actually played. The year and a half at Florida A and M, and then I finished my career at UNH. And how how were you guys at UNH? Successful? Dude, we were solid. We were solid, man. My my junior year, we made it to the conference championship, and we lost to a, a school called Assumption College, who was who was really really good. And they actually had I don't know if you ever heard of Deontay Harris. He's a All Pro kick returner for the Saints, and he was just a freshman when we played against him, and he was doing the same thing to us that now he does to the best players in the world. So they were a tough task. We only ended up losing the game by like two, but it was a it was a heartbreaker, man. It was a dogfight. And then this, the following year, my my senior year, when I transitioned to wide receiver, because we had another quarterback who was really good, very very good. He had a little stint with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers for for Canada, and um, so I ended up transitioning to receiver just because like. Coach, she said, like, you can still play quarterback and, I don't know, maybe maybe split time. But I, it wasn't a chance that I wanted to take. I didn't want to spend any time on the sideline as a senior. So I just uh, moved over to wide out and, and, and started a lot of games and played in a lot of games and did like that. Just any of the team. And, and I thought also that wide receiver would give me the better chance to play post-college. This is before I really knew anything about Europe. So I thought post-college, as far as NFL, CFL, I was thinking – 
probably wide receiver would be best because, I mean, obviously quarterback's the hardest position in all sports. And um, with my build at about 6'3", 210 at the time, 215, it was like perfect receiver size and stuff like that. But um, after I had – I went to the regional combine up at, uh, at um, the Minnesota Vikings facility, and I just – I was when I was talking to the scouts and everything, they were just telling me how good I looked throwing the ball and mechanics and smooth and everything. It was like maybe I shouldn't try to switch to receiver and just you feel me stay a quarterback. So I did, and um, had pro day at Yale. A few scouts there: Patriots, Giants, Jets, um, Colts, a couple more. And uh, I had a really good day, and I was able to uh, to uh, speak with an agent, and he thought he could get me in the CFL which obviously didn't work out, but that's fine. Everything happens for a reason. And um, that's when the quarterback before me at UNH, Joey Bradley, I don't know, you've probably heard of him. He's, he's, uh, he's been all around Europe, too. He's currently in Finland playing for the Coopio Steelers. And um, so he was just explaining how, how things work to me in Europe and stuff. Then I had another buddy, TJ Pryor, who played in Europe, won a championship in Italy and stuff. And I was like, this is really an option. And at the time, I'd never left the country. Never, never been outside the country. And it was just like, when it happened, I was like, I can't believe this is actually happening. <laughs> and then, so like, with all the experience that I had and the, the good film that I had and some decent stats, and I was able to, to get my foot in the door over here. And once you get in, as long as you don't completely suck or if you're okay or play decent, you can stay, you know? So it's like, it was all right. It was a, it was a good situation. For kids that want to go play in college, what would you say is the – you've seen all talent levels. What's the, the JUCO talent, the D1 talent, the D2 school talent? How do you compare those three places and the talent level, the vibe, kind of that whole situation? Yeah. Uh, so, obviously, there's talented guys everywhere. It's just when it, when it comes to the difference between the D1s and the, and the D2s and, and the NAI schools like that, it's just – it comes down to, to depth. So, like – for me, that's what I think, at least. And, and the trenches as well, like the O-line, D-line. But it's really it's really depth to me. So if you, you go to D1 school, we had six quarterbacks that were that could capably start in football games at the D1 level. And it's just a lot different than when I transferred to UNH when we have two guys, you know. And then um, Juco, is, it's like uh, it's hit or miss at some places, but there's really guys who are – are hungry like they these guys never had nothing given to them they obviously obviously because they had to go to juco route so it's like it's really hard work everybody's really putting in work constant consistent grind and um so the talent levels it, it differs as a whole but at any level you're gonna have dudes because people transfer people do everything people don't have grades it's, it's all types of all types of thing i would say for me at least though at florida a m that was the craziest level of talent that i ever seen just because we had so many dudes. Not that we didn't have dudes at UNH, because we did. We had one of the best players I've ever seen, my running back, Andre Anderson, the other quarterback, Andre Patterson, and our, our offensive lineman, Zach Wojtek, who, who actually had a stint with the Buffalo Bills. Like, so obviously there's dudes in D2, but it's just like, yeah, we had we had six, seven really, really good football players at, at UNH, as opposed to at Florida a and when we had 30, you know what I'm saying? And so, like the difference and, and then juco is just like man juco is a doggy dog world man it's like almost every man for himself and i mean but obviously the goal is to still win because like what do you play for but it's just like man everybody's trying to get their film get out put up good numbers and and then just continue their career so that's how that's how i compare them so take me into your first signing in europe the team you picked how you yeah. picked it who was all recruiting you and what countries and how you came to that decision yeah, so that happened really quickly, really, really quickly, because I was still in school. I graduated in May, so I was I was a late grad because a lot of people graduated. A lot of the guys in my class graduated in December. I graduated in May, and um, it was like May 13th or something like that. And I had I was talking to my agent, Joe Lee and Jason Kramer, both of those guys. They, they did a lot for me. And when nothing was biting for as far as getting a CFL camp invite or nothing like that, which, I mean, wasn't super surprising because obviously with the with the rules there and the dues they get from former NFL players, so it was it was kind of a long shot for me to even even get into the CFL. But um, after I graduated in um, May 13th, 
I was in Denmark May 17th, midseason, because they had some they had some visa or passport issues with the quarterback they had. He, he I, I guess he had, he was playing under contract. So I don't know. I don't know the details to it. I just know that they needed a quarterback, and I made a Euro players probably like two weeks after I didn't um, I didn't really hear anything from my agent from CFO stuff and. Uh, you you basically do your own recruiting when you're on Euro players. So um, I just – I actually didn't even send many messages out. I got a message from Triangle Razorbacks in Denmark who needed a quarterback to come midseason. And um, that's when I that's when I just took off. I got there. And then two or three days later, I've practiced once and we're playing against one of the premier organizations in Europe, and uh, Rostov Panthers, out here in Poland. And uh, <laughs> who's now playing in the ELF, the European League of Football, because they're just – that's how that's how good they are. So that um that was an experience for me for sure. I had a great time and made some made some good friends, some good buddies for life and stuff like that. And that's what got my foot in the door in Europe. And so I had got a little bit of film. People knew my name and and then from there it was just kind of smooth sailing to find teams and everything. So So what kind of led to your choice then to go to Hildesheim to Germany the next year? Dude, so my roommate my roommate Phil, he was German. And so, like, when we'd be in Denmark, he's, he was always watching the GFL games. And I'm just looking at him. I was watching the New Yorker Lions game versus the um, Dresden Monarchs. And I was like, yo, this football in Germany is really different. That is, like, legit. It's, like, like super professional. And, and they had dudes all over the field. And I was like, I want to play in that league. Didn't know if I could. Wasn't sure because I know they got ex-NFL guys, big-time D1 guys, the best European players and things like that. So I was just like, I want to play in that league. Like, I want to get a chance. So I might have, I might have reached out to every GFL team. <laughs> and then um, I finally got feedback from a few. I got feedback from, from Marburg. I got feedback from Munich Cowboys. I got feedback from a couple of other teams. And then I got a contract offer from, uh, from Hillside Invaders. And I, I didn't hesitate. I was just like, don't care what the contract looks like, although it was a good contract. I don't care that it was their first year in the GFL one or none of that. I was just like, I want to go get that GFL experience. So I did. And then that's how I ended up in Hildesheim. How, how'd your season go when you guys first year up in the GFL one? So it was the second year. So the first, the first year when I was in Denmark was their first year in GFL one. And then it was our, it was our second year in the GFL, my first year there. And it was rough, man. It was, it was tough. It was it was it was so tough. Plus, we were in the north, which is like, uh, I don't I don't really want to say just better because there's obviously good teams in the, in the south too. But it was really deep, like from from one to eight. Like all the teams were really really good. Aside from aside from Dresden and and uh, New York Alliance, anybody could be anybody on on any Saturday. And uh, we were we were pretty young. We had uh, we we're, we're really close to Braunschweig too. We were probably where the New York Alliance played probably. 30, 40 minute drive from Braunschweig. And um, so like all, like they get a lot of the, the better Germans from that area. And they also, they have so much money so they can buy wherever they want. But it was a, it was a tough season for sure. It was, it was a learning experience for me. I grew a lot as a player. Uh, I actually got better because like when you're playing against like t talent like that around you and things like that, like you, you have no choice but to perform better. So I had, a pretty good season as far as getting film and experience and things like that. The numbers weren't great. We didn't win a whole lot of games, but it was uh, it was it was definitely good for me, and it definitely made me better in preparing me for the next season that I played in Sweden, and obviously this season coming up here in Poland. How do you balance when you're on a less talented team and you guys kind of know that going in uh, your play with playing on schedule versus just kind of Superman ball trying to run around. Yeah make things yeah. happen, but still be smart? How do you balance all that? Man, it's just, it's just, we, we, we kind of try to, at least myself and a lot of the other guys, we just try to go into the mindset, into the game with the mindset that we're going to execute our stuff. Like if, if we, if we play a football game and don't get the win, that happens because it's football. It's hard to win a football game, but as long as we're not beating ourselves, and uh, just trying to do everything that we can. We can't leave plays out there, leave points out there and things like that. So we just go in with the, with the expectation to, to execute. And um, whether we're playing against the New York Alliance or 
or if we're playing against somebody not so good as them, like the Hamburg Huskies or something like that at the time, we just always went in with the same same mindset just to try to play our best, play within ourselves, and uh, compete, man. That's all. That's it. You can't go into a game. Oh, we're playing the Lions. We're, this one's going to get ugly real fast, or we're playing Hamburg, so we're probably going to win this game or, or put up numbers and things like that. You just got to have an even kill, you know, same – Regardless, and then, I mean, obviously, what actually happens on the field comes different than, than, than the mindset. But um, it's uh, it's 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 all relatively the same when you're going into a game, regardless of who you're playing against. Were you in charge of kind of like running the offense, designing any of the playbook or anything, or did you have a coordinator that you could kind of work with? Yeah, on? yeah. I had a I had an offensive coordinator in uh, in Hildesheim. Actually, my head coach. And our offensive coordinator both kind of co-ran the offense, and then they kind of switched roles like halfway through the season just to try to shake them, shake some things up. And uh, so it was, it was, it was solid. I didn't have to really implement a whole bunch of stuff, but they always listened to my to my input and everything, and took into consideration what what I thought, what I felt, because I'm the one that's on the field, you know. So it's just like you can call whatever, but you you still got to include your quarterback, and that's 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 anywhere in your, as opposed to if your quarterback is your offensive coordinator, or if you've got coordinators, everybody works together to try to, to try to game plan and, and, and come up with the right stuff. So. So what led you then to, uh, to Karlstadt, the Crusaders? Uh, all right. So, um, dude, I'd heard about Karlstadt Crusaders. I know they're one of the, one of the premier organizations in Europe. They play international all the time. They win games against, against big time teams and stuff like that. And, and, um, I reached out to, to Coach Kennedy and cross that, and they were looking for a quarterback for the first time in, I don't know, 10, 12 years, something like that, because they've always had a Swedish quarterback. But the one that they had previously retired, and then the one after him, also uh, he wanted to uh, test out the waters as an import player. So he, he took off to, to Poland and was playing up in Poland as an import. So it left them with a void at QB. They didn't have a, a Swede at the time who could, who could step in, because that's kind of their style to – to have a Swedish quarterback and put an American somewhere else, you know, rather than uh, your American be a quarterback. So, but that kind of led me to cross out. I knew they were a good organization. I've never been to Sweden. I, I like to play in new countries every year. That's like kind of my thing. I had never really thought about staying somewhere. So I was like, Sweden sounds though. I had a couple of buddies who, who played in Sweden previously and they were telling me about it. And like, dude, Sweden's awesome. And you're going to, likely the best team they had won. I don't remember. I know it was about 10 championships. It might have been 10 out of the last 12 or something like that. And then Stockholm emerged because they um there was another team near Stockholm called Tirzo Royal Crowns, and all of their guys pretty much went to Stockholm Machine. So it's basically like the two teams merged, and they, they became really, really good. They got a great coach over there, Coach Pillback and stuff. And um, so – that's that's kind of how I got to Sweden, and, and Sweden was a, a really good year for me. It was a successful year for us as a team, although we fell a little bit short of the goal. We um, we lost to one team all year, so and we competed. We played an international game against uh, Berlin Rebels from Germany, and we competed with them. It was it was solid. That was that was a, a really 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 good time for me. It was a really really solid organization, and um, and they just had they just had dudes, man. I had no idea Swedes could play football like they can. They were they were good. So that was a that was a good experience for me. So then coming into twenty twenty, were you supposed to play somewhere before COVID hit or what kinda of happened uh, with your, your life? So I I didn't know. I, I had no clue. I was I was kinda in, kinda out, didn't really know. I talked to some teams here and there, but I never could get myself to commit because I thought I was done. I was like I was like, man, I don't, I don't think I'm going to play. And then obviously COVID came in into play. And then when I realized that like, that like almost nobody played in 2020 besides a few countries, I was just like, man, I, I don't want to like, I just wanted to stop on my own terms. And even now I'm still undecided on whether I'm going to continue. But like right now I'm obviously all in and everything. And I don't know, my career could continue after this. We'll, we'll see how, how it goes here. But in, 2020, I was pretty much retired, man. I, I thought I was going to be done. And then just just factors played in, different factors played in, and I just made the decision to come back. And so here we are. <laughs> what, what led you to that that mindset of being done, you've done it all? What, what kind of led that? 
it was it was just like it's just tough being abroad i have a i have a four year old son back home in the states and it was just it's so tough to be this far away from him although there's facetime there's zoom and all of that other stuff there's all these things it was it was just tough but i got to spend the year in the states like the entire 2020 in the states uh spend as much time with with him as i could and everything and i'm just i talk to a bunch of my buddies all the time who are who playing abroad or some who like wish they could play abroad and and it just it's just it came down to like man i'm not going to be able to do this forever because i'm i'm 27 i turn 28 next month at some point there's there's going to come a time where i stop getting offered contracts to come play quarterback in europe because like guys are coming fresh out of college every year 22 23 years old and i was just like man to this point i've gotten to live in three different countries i've got to see a few different countries and and get that experience playing experience and it just it just builds the resume too cuz maybe i want to coach one day and it just it just builds the resume and i was just like man i got to enjoy this while i can if it weren't for football I probably would have never gotten to see any any countries outside of the us or canada or something like that and uh so <laughs> one of my boys man he's he's a clown dude my boy he was like hey I was like, I was just asking, I was like, so what, what do you think? What would you do in, in my situation? He was just like, he's one of my closest friends. He's like, man, we're going to be 89 one day. <laughs> like, you're going to be oh, one day. You're going to, like, you will definitely regret not doing it more than you would doing it. So, and I, I thought about that. I dwelled on that for a long time. And, and football is what I do. It's what I know best. It's, it's been my life for the last 22 years. I played ever since I was five years old. And um, 2020 was the first year that I didn't play football since uh, literally child. And uh, it just it just didn't feel right. Something was off. But I'd rather walk away when when I need to than when I don't really need to. So that's kind of how I ended up back. Uh, yeah, I think I think a lot of us kind of went through. Ed, did you have any of these countries that have kind of felt like home at all? Or how do you deal with the homesickness and the the uh, the being away, you know, yeah. America probably you still miss things about America, but you're also seeing yeah. something new. Don't talk about mm-hmm. that. Now, I don't I don't really get homesick. I don't get to the point where I'm like, man, I want to go home where I miss home because like I obviously live in a moment and embrace any situation that I'm in. But uh as far as a country that just felt like home to me, I would probably say Sweden. Sweden felt like a home. I feel like I had family in Sweden and things like that. I mean I still too I'll talk I'll talk to those guys daily talk to coach Kennedy every once in a while still. He's like, he's like a father figure to me. He's, he's a great dude. He's, he's an um, amazing dude. So Sweden definitely feel like home, but I don't really, I don't really miss the States when I'm here. Some people when I'm, when I'm here, but not really just being there in general. It's just like, like, man, you know, it's like the import life, dude, it doesn't really get much better, you know, as far as, as far as just um, getting paid to do what you love being like not having the stressors of like bills rent things like that you know it's just it's just um it's a different feeling than it is in the states as it kind of can get stressful for you like i, I was in in the states the whole 2020 and worked every single day and it was just like man like i really missed that life over in 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 europe so it was like as opposed to missing home i, I missed europe you know so it was it was definitely uh played a part in getting back over here do you think there's a scenario where you do try to maybe set up somewhere in Europe and continue to play and coach and become more at home in one of these countries then? Um, I'm, I'm not sure at the moment. I mean, anything can happen. I'm here for the next six months or so. So we'll see, we'll see what it is, what it is here. And Warsaw is, is really, it's a really dope place so far. I've, I've gotten to see a bit of the city here and there, like in some, in some downtime and it's good. So, it all depends on the the place, the organization, the field, what my goals and and the team's goals, and because like um, it just it, it just all has to basically gel together for me to want to stay permanently, which I'm not opposed to, but um, it it, ha- it hasn't happened yet, so we'll see. I'm I'm hoping that this year is is a an eye opener or something for me. Anything can happen. We'll see. I'm just open to it. Yeah. How, how do you lead? How do you get the guys on board with you come in, new quarterback, new season, yeah. new system? Yeah. How do you get them all get them all with you in that huddle? Yeah, so I, I try to first, I try to first by example, by like with my play, with my my knowledge of the game. And then I'm a, I've never been like a, a really, really huge vocal leader, although I'm still the quarterback. So you will hear me 
more than you hear most guys, or in, as opposed to like a crazy linebacker or something that plays defense. You know how those guys are. But so I try to lead with just my play, performance, work ethic, and then that's when you'll start to hear me like like vocalize being a leader and things like that. So I just kind of ease my way in, and then boom, they then most of the time they follow. Like <laughs> that's just that's just how it goes. So. How do you balance being a being a good import, an import that leaves a, an example on the local guys? With a, yeah. I think we've all seen imports that they're not as receptive to. Yeah, um, I don't, I don't really, I never really had issues as far as as being not being perceived well, like as a good person. I just try, I just, I don't really try anything. I just be myself and uh, play football to the best of my ability, and then just literally just it comes down to the different kind of people there are there's there's people that can come to your hella football players hella good football players but like not very like I don't know involved with the guys outside of football or or even the community the youth programs and, and things like that so like but I enjoy all of it like I enjoy having friends in these different countries and and going places and exploring and doing stuff and it kind of just it, you just got to have like an open in personality and to be to be like perceived well and accepted in, in these countries it's 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 a lot more I would say I don't want to say a lot more but there's definitely a huge leisure side as 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 there is business you know so it's just kind of a total package yeah absolutely what's been uh you said Sweden was the most at home what's the what's the best team you've played on so far overseas oh that's a good question that's a good question because like it's just different because because in Germany we had so many import players, so many we had a, a few Americans, we had a bunch of European import players and and good ones too. That was we we were very very talented as far as individual guys, but the best team that I, I played on as a whole was probably the Crossback Crusaders. They were really 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 good team. Like everything was it was structured. It was like I just came right in and it just fit. You know, it was not like we had to piece a whole bunch of things together and stuff like that. They were already a, a well-oiled machine, and they just needed to plug in the the missing piece. You know what I'm saying? And although we didn't win the championship, we had a lot of success. We 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 blew some teams out. We we had some fun out there, and it was just normal to them. They're they're used to they're used to being like cream of the crop, top tier team, and and it shows. It shows that they do a really good job from everything from like um, building up the youth to get ready to play in the Super Series, and they even have a women's team that is that is champions, and it's just a all around well ran organization. Some great people in that organization, great management, great coaches, and things like that. I could rave all day about how good the organiz organization is at, at cross that. So I would say that would be the best team that I played on. I don't know if we would head to head beat my team in Germany just because it's a different brand of football in Germany, but like as far as um, Everything else as a whole, pound for pound, I think we were – that was the best team that I played on in Europe. How, how does the Polish team compare? Because I feel like Germany, every country you go to, people talk about how great they are in Germany, how great they are in Austria. Everyone knows about yeah. the Crusaders. How's Poland? Mm -hmm. It kind of falls into a crack where I don't – you know, I don't really know. Is it really good? Is yeah. it not? It's, it's yeah. different leagues. Yeah, there's there's good teams here. There's very good teams here in, in Poland. Obviously, the the team that everybody knows in Poland, Rostov Panthers, they can compete with anybody. They um they're not playing in the Polish league this year because they're just gonna play in the ELF. But so like so far, man, we've had we've had I've only been here a week. We've had a few practices, some some weight training and stuff like that. The dudes work hard. They're they're athletic. They can they can run and catch. They can they can uh they can move. They can do everything. We haven't. We haven't really hit or anything, so blocking and tackling, we're gonna see how it goes. But um, I mean, from what I from what I know, they they play a good brand of football here in Poland too. It's 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 probably not the GFL or the Super Series or things like that. But I mean, every country the level is different. Like that's what I tell people all the time. They're like, "What's the level like as far as when you go over to Europe?" And I think it's honestly harder to play in Europe than it was in college because like. In college, you got 50 scholarship guys who have been playing football their whole life, and you just do your part as opposed to coming over here and you've got to be the guy rather than a guy, you know. So 
But um, I think that it, that, 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 that that's the first here in Poland. Like I'll probably have a bigger role here in Poland than I had in Sweden or in or in Germany, just because like uh, import rules are different and the level is a little bit different. So um, I think I think we could have a, a successful season. We definitely got some good football players. We got good coaching and stuff like that. So um, we'll see. I'll know more. I'll be able to give you more information on how it looks as the season goes on. Our first games in a month and. We, I've only practiced for a week, so I don't really have um, anything more that I can elaborate on yet. So, Have you seen the sport grow since you first came over four or five years ago, four years ago? Oh, yeah, absolutely, absolutely, definitely. And it's, and it's uh, I've seen it grow from, from, different, from different perspectives, too. So I've watched, uh, I've watched how, how the Danish league has grown and how it's gotten a lot more competitive as – rather than there just being two teams that everybody knows are going to meet in the championship now. It's just like everybody's been building building their brand and and uh, becoming more competitive. The German Football League, like the team I was on, Hildesheim, they, we went from winning three or four football games to those guys ended up making the playoffs in, in 20, 2019. And then so the Swedish league, it's, it's, it looks kind of, I don't know, I didn't really know much about the Swedish league before I got there, so I don't know how how much it's it's grown but i know that like with with like afi you're you're familiar with uh, american football international right yep, yep. like with the, with the coverage and everything they do it just it's just definitely elevating the sport in each country because it's becoming more popular and more known so and um the polish league COVID actually in my opinion helped this this polish league because they were one of like three or four that played last year so like after after the seasons, guys were playing in Finland and stuff. They would shoot over to Poland and, and finish the second half of the season. And so now people know that like the Polish has a league and it's it's competitive and you can go have some success there too. So I've definitely seen it grow as far as like on field performance and popularity and stuff like that. What if you were going to grow a club yourself over here in Europe? What do you what do you think is the key and what do you think some clubs do wrong? Besides money, what makes those clubs yeah. the elite clubs and other ones not? So, so money out of the equation, it's it's going to start with your coaching. It's going to start with your coaching staff. It's going to start also from like your youth. You've got to have guys that want to play, that want to learn, that want to that that just love the sport. So, when you build your program from the youth up, and then you're now feeding guys into your senior teams, stuff like that. I think, I think that's the key. It's kind of like like look at the Schwabish Hall Unicorns, how how successful they are. Like they have a phenomenal program from top to bottom. Like as far as kids to teenagers to adults, it's just I think it starts from the coaching and it starts from building from the youth. Yeah, absolutely. Well, uh, thank you, Shazan. I appreciate you coming on. Yeah. Uh, can you hey. drop your Instagrams and Twitters? People yeah. can follow you. Yeah. Uh, my, my thing on every social media platform is at Shaz Mumfrey five, never going to change. It's been that forever. So, uh, yeah, but man, I appreciate you having me on, bro. It's definitely good talking to you. Yeah, guys. So everyone go follow them. They're going to start their season April 17th. The Warsaw yeah. Eagles. See, she's on yeah, play. Sir. He's a, the human highlight film. Appreciate you. <laughs> hey, thanks, bro. Have a good one, man. Yeah. Appreciate you.